this week on Motor Week, how you can order an S-Reg car in August and get a free replacement T-Reg in March. Richard Hammond learns driving dynamics and Chris Goffey takes off in a trooper. Well, we've come to Brands Hatch today for the launch of Driving Dynamics. It's a brand new driving course, but it's aimed not at driving out there on the racetrack, but at driving out there on the road in real life. Okay, Tim, can you just explain to us, firstly, what today is about, and secondly, why you're carrying something that I might have in the bath? Right. Yeah, expensive Christmas present. We're trying to make people better drivers of the metal box, of the car itself. Uh, there's a lot of driving courses about, all of them are very valuable, but we think not enough of them concentrate on actually getting the right response from the vehicle, learning what goes wrong when you push the wrong button at the wrong time or the right button at the right time, and the effects that that will have on the car. And a very good way of explaining that is having this tool so that you can show people what happens with weight distribution when you brake, when you turn, and when you accelerate, and the effects when it goes wrong and sending the weight too quickly from one end to the other and having an unstable, imbalanced car. Our first taste of weight transfer in a moving car in a safe environment came here in the slalom. And here we were told it's all about keeping it tight, about minimal input through the controls to achieve minimum transfer of weight to keep the whole car flowing smoothly through the slalom. Next it's onto the understeer course and here we have two corners, two curves, one tightening and one a constant radius. The idea here is, well it's easy really, put the car into it at an ever increasing speed. Each time you go around, faster and faster until you induce deliberate understeer. Then all you've got to do is correct it. Wind off some of the lock to achieve increased grip and lift off the throttles just a little and it should come back into line. Oh god I'm gonna die! Next it's onto the braking section and we find out just how significant those three letters are, ABS, anti-lock braking system. The whole point of it is not to stop more quickly, but to be able to steer while stopping. But then of course sometimes it can go horribly wrong. The idea of this as we spin around in ever increasing circles on this damp and greasy track is to illustrate how to correct understeer. And it also has the effect of making me regret having had quite so many Danish pastries during the briefing this morning. And now, all of us let loose on the roads. So as we leave the main gates, heading out towards the road, the real thing, what's, what's the actual point of this part? The purpose of this exercise is purely and simply to highlight the fact that when we're driving, we normally know where, more or less, we're going from A to B, and we don't normally observe the book that's written out in front of us, i.e. the road signs and road markings, that's given us an early warning of any hazards that might be approaching. We now notice we come into a 30 limit sign, and so as I'm talking, I'm just highlighting the amount of book that is written out in front of us. Um, in the centre of the road on this occasion, we have what looks like central road markings, but it isn't in fact, it's a hazard warning line, which means they're broken, which means we can cross them if it's necessary, but in actual fact, this is not the place to do any overtaking, because it's warning the driver that we've got either junctions or bending the road, or whatever else is going to go on. It means there's hazards ahead. And here we've got a slow written in the road, and on the left we've got a marker ball telling us the edge of the road, and off we go. So that's the book I refer to. Uh, that's a lot of information then. It's, 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 it's a book, it's, ah. it's, it's actually written here. If one does 100% concentration um, and keep, one keeps to the limit, one is always a lot, lot safer. But I noticed as well that you didn't, for instance, go, oh my god, there's a JCB! Because there was, and it, I mean, it loomed at us around the corner. So I, I gripped the old seat there. Ooh. I thought, well, you don't do that. My position in the road was of such that I just felt that he was in his correct position, I was in my correct position, and there was no danger. So we're talking about staying cool and calm. It's staying attitude. cool and calm, yeah. It's attitude. Yeah, it comes back to your attitude. Attitude being that um, the major cause of road accidents is attitude. And I, I would say that the biggest, biggest, biggest thing you can do to get your right attitude is always leave five minutes early. Reg, that was it. Around the highways and byways. Well, Richard, I've got to say that uh, right from the start when you sat in the car, you seem to be in, a, in control of it. 
So by and large, I felt very safe sitting here. Um, congratulations on your drive, and I'm I'm pleased to see you do it that way. No so, screaming. So well done. Thank you very much. Cheers, Reg. That's a relief. That's it for my day of driving dynamics, and it's taught me a lot, and that's a good point, because next time you're looking at a motoring survey, and there's the bit, the, the little boxes that say, tick this box to say how good you think you are as a driver. We nearly all of us nearly always rate ourselves as fantastic. We tick the box that says best, 10 out of 10. But most of the time, actually, we're not. And that's just the problem. Driving is such an ego thing. You can criticize how we look, where we live, what we do, anything but our driving. And that's exactly what this day has been aimed at. And in fact, if you think you don't need today, then it's you who does need a day like today. I'm here at the Honda plant at Swindon in Wiltshire for the official line-off ceremony for the Honda Aero Deck. Oh, that's a state to you and me. The Aero Deck is the third model to be built here, joining the Accord four-door and the Civic five-door. What's unique about the Aero Deck? is that this is the first Honda ever to be completely designed, financed and built within Europe. Why was the decision made to open the plant here in Swindon? I mean, it could have been anywhere really in Europe, couldn't it? What were the factors that were... Uh, I've asked that question often. The prime reason is that the Japanese and the Brits culturally can communicate well in a funny sort of say way we understand each other and there's a comfort level. I think our Japanese colleagues feel comfortable maybe the language in Britain and I think if you spoke to all the associates here they feel very comfortable working in this environment. I mean the, we've seen the Aerodeck here which is the first car that's been totally built, financed and designed in Europe. That must mean that things are going well at Swindon then? Excellent, really excellent. Uh, as Mr. Edo said we're now up to 109,000 last year. We'll achieve 150,000 manufacturing this year. That's a tremendous growth from only producing cars in five years. Last year, 100,000 cars came out of this factory. And by the end of 98, Honda hoped that that figure will have increased to 150,000 cars rolling off the production lines. So that means more jobs. And it also means a great boost to the local economy, as 90% of the Aerodex parts will be supplied from within Europe. We're going to be, or we're now in the process of recruiting another 400 uh, staff in here in Swindon now. With the view of taking our total uh, staff level up to just under 3,000 people into next year. That is a huge impact in Swindon. Teamwork is a key word here at the plant. And there are no bosses and no workers. Everyone is an associate. And each associate, no matter what their job, was the same, regulation issue, overalls and baseball cap. Management offices aren't tucked away in flush suites on the top floor. Nope, they're right next to the production lines, with large windows overlooking everything, to encourage the sense of, we're all in it together. Getting on for nearly 10 years ago, Mazda took a very brave step. Their rivals derided them at the time because Mazda introduced to the world a two-seater open-top roadster for the mass market. And so, the MX-5 was born. It was the catalyst for the rebirth of the roadster market and it took the competition a long time to catch up. Rover brought us the MGF, BMW the Z3 and Mercedes the SLK, although the BMW and Mercedes not quite in the same league. Well now, after 420,000 sales worldwide, the MX-5 has been given a fresh new look. Not a complete sex change, but some gentle facelifting by a skilled surgeon. Now on initial appearance, the new MX-5 may look very similar to the old one, and you could be right in thinking that, but this is a 90% new car over the old shape MX-5. And there are some very subtle changes, some different curves, the rear end is a bit different, and here at the front is probably where you'd notice it most, those lovely gorgeous pop-up headlights, sadly gone. Safety reasons, cost reasons, who knows what, but the pop-up headlights gone. These headlights though offer a lot better illumination than over the previous ones.
Under the bonnet you have a choice of two engines, the 1.6 and 1.8 litre have both been retained but with increased power. The 1.6 is up to 110 brake horsepower and this 1.8 litre to 140 brake horsepower, giving better acceleration, top end speed and also a very good fuel consumption and still very good insurance rates as well. So let's see how this 1.8 drives, take it for a spin. Tim, what was the reason why Mazda decided to change a winning formula and introduce the new MX-5? Well, the car was launched in 1990. Nearly half a million have been sold uh, and things move on. Our customers, we talk to them regularly and they've told us that one or two things need to be improved. Uh, we've improved them and we've come back stronger than ever with a fantastic car. What would you say to existing MX-5 owners, the main differences they would find if they jump in the new one? Oh, I think that's very easy. The car's quicker, uh, it's only a tiny bit heavier, uh, and so with more power, that gives it the, the extra speed. It's more economical. Uh, it's got product benefits, uh, some changes, for example, there's a rear glass screen, uh, which is all new and totally unique in, in the sports car market. Uh, it's got twin airbags, it's got a bigger boot, so there are many differences. And apart from anything else, just to set it off, there's some very nice new colours as well. And what about the pop-up headlights? They've, they've gone by the way, sadly now. A lot of old MX-5 customers will, will be disappointed to see them go. What was the main reason behind it? Aerodynamics and fuel efficiency, really, um, and also better lighting capability at dark. So, yes, I mean, the unique uh, feature of the last car were the pop-up headlamps, but the new car is, is much more efficient, uh, and it has a slightly new face as a result, and people will, I'm sure, come to uh, get used to that over time. Extensive efforts were made to minimise weight on the new MX-5 and to avoid middle age spread. The front and rear overhangs are lighter and weight has been moved forward wherever possible towards the centre of the car to achieve excellent balance and weight distribution. The new body shares the same dimensions and wheelbase as the current MX-5 except for the width and that's ensured that the car maintains all the compactness and manoeuvrability of the original car. The 0-62 miles per hour acceleration time for the 1.6 litre is now just 9.7 seconds and the 1.8 litre reaches 0-62 in 8 seconds. Top speed for the 1.6 litre is 118 miles per hour and 127 miles per hour for the 1.8 litre. Output and torque for both engines has been improved through enhancements to the intake and exhaust systems, resulting in smooth engine revving from low to high speeds and responsive accelerations. Features such as straight intake port, a variable inertia exhaust system on the 1.8 and a dual exhaust manifold have been incorporated. The performance increases have been offset by detailed attention to minimising repair costs in the new design. The 1.6 is Group 11, the 1.8 Group 12 and the 1.8 IS Group 13. Inside the cabin remains very much the same. It's not packed with creature comforts, but there's everything you need and it's all close at hand, very nicely laid out. But perhaps the biggest revelation is the way that the new MX-5 now drives. It's of course always been a fun car to drive, but now the engines are more powerful and the handling sharper and more responsive. It's really reminiscent of the golden age of motoring. It's such a fun car to drive. And with the price of the MX-5, it allows more people to get into this sort of car. Who would want to pay double for a Mercedes SLK or 10 grand more for a BMW Z3. Not me.
Well, what tremendous fun. The new MX-5 has retained the qualities that made the old one so good. It handles better, it drives better, there's more power, and there's hardly any increase in price. Mazda aim to sell around 5,000 of these a year, and their philosophy of, if it ain't broke, there's no need to fix it, certainly seems to have worked. Put an old shape MX-5 and a new one side by side and you'll really notice the differences. So if you want open top motoring, try an MX-5. They're fun. After the break, Goffy gets going in the new Isuzu and the offer we didn't at first believe. This is the story of how the little guy beat the big guy at his own game. Now the little guy is International Motors of West Bromwich and the big guy is Vauxhall Motors. And the game, well, the rights to sell this vehicle. Now back in 1987, International Motors first launched the Trooper. It rapidly won a good reputation for reliability and toughness. It was cheaper than a, a Land Cruiser or a Shogun and more comfortable than a basic Land Rover. Trouble was, Vauxhall started casting envious eyes at the International Motors' success. Their Frontier wasn't going terribly well, so when the new model came in 1992, Vauxhall launched it as well as the Vauxhall Monterey, and I remember the launch of the vehicle. And the result? Well, here we are in Bonnie, Scotland again, with the new Isuzu Trooper sold through International Motors of West Bromwich. Vauxhall will still sell you a Monterey, in fact they'd be delighted to sell you one, they've still got a lot of last year's models to shift, but General Motors, which owns Vauxhall and 37% of Isuzu, has allowed International Motors to launch the new vehicle. Three trim levels, standard duty and citation, two body styles, short wheelbase like this and long wheelbase, and two new engines. This is the new petrol engine, a three and a half litre double overhead camshaft V6, 24 valves, developing 215 brake horsepower. That's enough to give it a maximum speed of 112 miles an hour and a sub 10 second 0-60 time. But the really big news is the new diesel engine, the first pressurised rail injection diesel in a passenger car in the UK. Developed by Caterpillar, the earth-moving people, it means that the diesel is in a pressurized rail on top of the engine and electronic injectors put precisely the right amount of fuel into each cylinder. And pretty massive cylinders they are too. This is a three-litre engine and it's only a four-cylinder. Develops huge amounts of torque low down and the new injection, according to Isuzu, means that it doesn't rev up like an earth mover you've got instant throttle response. Quite a functional interior. They haven't forgotten their roots as working vehicles, and in fact the van version is still available. Looks uh, pretty utilitarian, quite bare plastic, but quite a high level of interior equipment. Um, rather messy design, and uh, thankfully avoiding the fake wood that you see in so many of these allegedly luxury 4x4s. But the real test of something like this is how does it go off-road? Isuzu took us to the top of a mountain near Kelso to explore off-road capability. With the demonstrators on mud tyres, we headed up into the conifer forest where heavy wood machinery had been tearing great chunks out of the peat bog. Even so, not desperately demanding, and the trooper just romped through everything we could find. The trooper always had a big, tough chassis underneath the bodywork, and of course, that continues. However, they've been playing around with the spring rates and the damper rates, and the stiffness of the anti-roll bars. And in addition to that, they've also moved the wheels out slightly on the body. In other words, it's got a wider track. The result is that it's got a more predictable ride on the road. It feels that it goes in a straight line now, whereas before, like a lot of big 4x4s, it tended to sort of move around on the road and need constant steering correction. 
Changes in the transmission department too. There's now a fascia mounted switch so you can select four wheel drive in high range at any speed on the move up to 62 miles an hour. As before, selection of low range is by this lever down on the transmission tunnel. There's a new automatic gearbox, three speed with an overdrive ratio. And it's interesting that Isuzu say this vehicle is quicker to 60 miles an hour in automatic form than it is in uh, manual gearbox form. And that's against the industry norm. Must be something to do with the truck-like gearbox. Prices? Well, the range runs from 19,000 to 26,650. The Isuzu Trooper, okay, it's faster and smoother than its predecessors, but at heart it's still a vehicle that really could work for its living, if you need it to. It hasn't quite joined the carpet, leather and walnut set. Good. The news this week, and we had to double check this offer from Deyu, as it seemed too good to be true. They're offering a thousand customers the opportunity to own the latest registration models in August 98 and March 99. If you order a new Deyu for August delivery, you can choose to have the vehicle replaced free of charge by an equivalent T-registered model in March next year. Of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch and Deyu will benefit from having 1,000 nearly new cars of their latest range, which will appeal to different buyers. This week, the DVLA will begin issuing new style photo card driving licenses. If you hold a paper driving license, you'll not be affected until your license expires or details change. Same size as a credit card, and there'll be driver's photograph and signature, along with other data on the card. Demand for the new Astra has encouraged Vauxhall to create over a thousand extra jobs. A third shift will be introduced at Ellesmere Port in Merseyside to cope with strong demand throughout Europe. Van and saloon versions will be added to the hatch currently in production to boost capacity to 180,000 units a year. Great news for the British car production industry. That's all for this week. From MotorWeek, next week, the Lexus GS300, the RCA Awards, the Royal College of Art, and the Skoda Octavia. We'll leave you with these shots of the new Octavia that's taken the automotive world by storm. Look at those curves, look at the sleekness, look at that design. Suddenly, it's not funny to laugh at Skoda anymore. <laughs>